Okay, IB Biology students, uh, I'm going to make a video real quick on um, negative feedback of, um, of the pancreas uh, with glucose levels. And this is going to be in relationship to diabetes. This is what they're going to ask. They're going to say something like, explain the role of the pancreas and the hormones involved in the regulation of glucose and maybe why that's an example of negative feedback or feedback inhibition. So, you know, we've talked about what feedback inhibition is and I want to start off by just re-emphasizing to you. Feedback inhibition is when the end product somehow shuts down the process that causes the product. Let me say that again. The end product is somehow going to shut off the process that in actually makes that product. So if that's true, for uh, the glucose production, then somehow glucose will shut off the production of glucose. Boy, can you see that? That's kind of the lighting is where they're. Somehow or another, glucose has got to shut off the production of glucose in order for it to be negative, negative feedback. Another thing is, is that they, sometimes they ask questions about uh, target cells and give an example of how a hormone can act on target cells. And so we're going to be talking about that also. So right now I want to stop and, and make you have to commit this to memory. It's the fact that in the pancreas you've got two types of cells. You've got alpha cells and beta cells. And alpha cells are going to actually produce glucagon and then the beta cells, which kind of look like that, beta cells, are going to produce insulin. And both types of cells are in the pancreas. So we just have to remember that alpha cells produce glucagon and beta cells produce insulin. That's going to be really important as we move through the explanation. So then, no matter what the question is, I don't care what they ask you, if you think that this discussion is going to be about the pancreas, then I want you to do the following. I want you to draw, why can I not get this to do better here? Then I want you to draw a line, kind of a dividing line, on a piece of paper. You just have some empty paper. And I want you to write on this side over here that the stimulus is going to be that there's uh, the glucose is too, the glucose is too low, is a stimulus. And on this side, I want you to write down that the stimulus is glucose is too high. So that's all we've got so far is too low, too high. Then I want you to come back. This is the easiest way for me to understand it. I want you to talk about the fact that right here, coming up, you've got a bunch of glucose. And the glucose itself is going to act on the pancreas. And it's going to act on the beta cells of the pancreas. Now this is a little, it's a little bit counterintuitive to me. Because I would think that the top part of my chart might have the alpha cells and the bottom part of my chart might have the beta cells, but I don't want you to think that way. It's actually backwards. It's the top part has the beta cells and the alpha cells are going to be down here. So they're going to be like across from each other, but they're not like intuitive where you think they would be. These are the beta cells up here and down here will be the alpha cells. So the glucose itself acts on the pancreas and the beta cells are the target cells. So these are target cells in the pancreas and they're going to tell the pancreas hey we need you to release a hormone and the hormone that we want you to release is insulin 
Okay, now y'all have heard of insulin before. We've talked about it. Insulin is what people that are diabetic, they take insulin shots. That's what they do is, is they feel like they're getting, you know, uh, they don't have enough ATP, they're sluggish, they're lethargic, they're really exhausted, and, and that's because they can't get the glucose into their cells. They need a way to uptake that glucose. And what normal people, people that don't have diabetes, their insulin levels are normally high. And so the insulin facilitates the uptake of that glucose into the body cells. But people that have diabetes, just their bodies, their beta cells do not produce insulin or not enough of it. And so therefore they cannot get the glucose into their body cells. So they have high levels of glucose floating around in their blood, but they can't get it up into their body cells, therefore they can't make ATP. So with the insulin that comes out in a normal person, that insulin that comes out is going to do basically two things. The first thing it's going to do is it's going to allow body cells to take up well, I'm sorry, to take up glucose. Now remember, the stimulus is we have too much glucose in the blood. We're trying to say, how can we reduce the amount of glucose? Well, one way to do that is the glucose itself, the glucose acts on the pancreas and says, hey, beta cells, make some insulin. And when that insulin is released, that insulin acts on the body cells and says, take that glucose up and use it for cell respiration. So that's one thing that can happen. Or another thing is that same insulin can act on the liver. And it can say, hey liver, I need you to store glucose for me in the form of glycogen. So the liver can actually convert the glucose into glycogen and glycogen is just a it's a it's a uh, carbohydrate that is used to store uh, well as actually I think it's a fat but it's it's used to store glucose and just make it available as needed and so we store glycogen either in the liver or also in skeletal muscle so like in your uh, biceps or in your uh, you know, muscles in your legs or whatever, there's going to be glycogen stored. But either way, both of those things reduced the amount of glucose. So now then, we end up having what? The stimulus is not enough glucose. There's too low of levels of glucose in the blood. So now we got to figure out how can we get more glucose, all right? Remember we said we had the pancreas here? We're going to also have the pancreas down here. And instead of it being the beta cells, now we're going to have the alpha cells. And so glucose, even though there's not a lot of it, there's a little bit of it, the glucose in low concentrations will act on the alpha cells of the pancreas. And it'll say, hey, pancreas, we need you to secrete another hormone. We know you already secreted insulin, and we appreciate that. That allowed us to get some of that glucose out of the blood, but now there's not enough glucose, so we want you to secrete another hormone called glucagon. And glucagon is the hormone that actually acts on the liver to do the opposite of this. If this is how, if insulin caused the liver to convert glucose into glycogen, maybe the glucagon will tell the liver to hydrolyze, hydrolyze the glycogen into the glucose. So if you hydrolyze glycogen into glucose, you're actually releasing glucose into the blood. But now let's think about this for just a minute. If glucose is released, 
is it possible that you can end up with too much glucose in the blood? Is that possible? Yes. Well, guess what? That very glucose that there's too much of will tell the pancreas to produce insulin, which will ultimately cause the reduction of glucose. So isn't it true that glucose itself shut down the production of glucose or the amount of glucose by using insulin? Granted, yes, insulin was involved, but the stimulus of too much glucose is what ultimately caused the glucose to go down or be uptaken and be reduced. So that is an example of negative feedback, also sometimes called feedback inhibition. So hopefully that was a better explanation. I was struggling on that in class, and then some of y'all weren't even in class today. So I wanted you to be exposed to that uh, as an example of uh, negative feedback in the body. So hopefully you can get that. You may want to watch it more than one time. But with that said, best of luck. I'm out.